Okay, I don't, I don't know if we're going to have any more, but the folks that are here, I'll just ask you to grab a seat, and uh, where our time is uh, scheduled now, so we'll carry on. First of all, I say good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to this session. Our session today is entitled Getting Youth Off the Bench, and it's about engaging youth in our community. My name is Bobby Woods. I'm the SUMA rep for the North on the SUMA board. I'm also the mayor of the Northern Village of Buffalo Narrows. And of course, you probably were at other sessions where you were reminded, so I need to do this again. Even though you've heard it a few times, information on emergency exits and AED location can be found on page 25 of your convention, 2019 handbook. We wanna make sure our delegates are safe. Please note that this session is being audio recorded. That means if you wanna ask a question, we need you to go to the mic. Identify yourself and your municipality and speak clearly into the mic when asking your question. Using the mic means that everyone in the room can hear you, including our speaker. And the question is on, on recording. Later this month, the presentations will be available on the SUMA YouTube channel, and we want those recordings to be good, a good resource for you. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Chief Cadmus DeLorme. Chief DeLorme is a citizen and chief of Cowessess First Nation. He graduated from the Cowessess Community Education Center and achieved an undergraduate degree at the First Nations University of Canada and a master's degree at the Johnson Shoyama School of Public Policy. He was elected chief in 2016. For those of you with the new SUMA convention app, you can read more about our presenter here. When you read this, his full bio, you can see the work he has put into it, gaining the knowledge he is going to share with you here. When we plan events for our members, we try to tailor the topics and speakers for your needs. Please give our speaker your full attention and be open to how his information can apply to your municipality. Some lessons are gonna be easier to apply than others. However, I'm sure everyone in this room can use this valuable information when you get back to your office. Ladies and gentlemen, give Cadmus a warm welcome. Thank you for that warm introduction. I got here at three and I walked into the upstairs room and I was thinking, am I presenting to this audience up here? <laughs> I didn't even bring a USB stick, I was thinking. Uh, but uh, you know, regardless of the audience size, um, the uh, topics that we discuss are all important. Uh, I'm Chief Cadmus DeLorme of the Cowes' First Nation in Southeast Saskatchewan Treaty 4 Territory. I'm 36 years old, I look young. Um, that's that reserve water I grew up showering in why I look so young. <laughs> I'm uh, the youngest of nine children. Uh, my mom and dad are both baby boomer generation. Um, so growing up at my house, you used to hear, uh, so my mom and dad had separate families before they, they had me as maybe some of us can relate. So growing up at my house, you used to hear, honey, your kid and my kid are beating up our kid. <laughs> I, I was our kid, yeah, yeah. I, um, both my parents um, attended uh, residential school as, uh, as that generation did. Uh, I did not. I was born in 1982. I was raised, uh, out of the nine children, I was the only one to not go to a residential school. So growing up at my house, um, we'd have supper in the summertime and holidays, and sometimes the reaction to some of our conversations was so unique because um, I didn't have maybe a bitterness or an anger or a frustration that sometimes these residential schools would create in some of my people and my family. And I would be so calm about things and I, and I was like asking like, why? Why do you want to dig in your heels and, and fight back? Why do you want, why does that make you so angry? Like, just let it pass you by kind of attitude. and. So I already knew I was different, even within my own kitchen table. And as I got older, I started to um, <clears throat> progress. I left Cowses after graduating, born and raised on Cowses. Absolutely, it takes a community to raise a child. And I got five nicknames at home on Cowses, so you know you're well-liked when you got five nicknames at home. And uh, after the age of 20, I um, 
left Cowses. I wanted to pursue more work opportunities. I wanted to uh, get an education. I just wanted to explore the world. Uh, Broadview and Yorkton were my big worlds at the time around Brown Cowses. So I tried off the big city. And a um, couple years of work, uh, I eventually made my way to First Nations University of Canada. And being a young, young indigenous male in the early 2000s, living in Regina, growing up on Cowses, didn't necessarily mean that I knew what an indigenous person was, what a First Nation person was, what an Aboriginal was, what a native was, was it, what an Indian was. I had all these terms, and I was just trying to survive and just buy a Cadillac Escalade in a mansion. That was my big, <laughs> that was my big goal because of all these music videos that uh, inspired me to want all this stuff, all this material. And at the age of 25, I started to realize that it wasn't the material I was chasing. I was chasing as who I am, as Cadmus, a guy from Cowses, a Cree, a Soto person. And so I eventually started to, you know, kind of think, of maybe I should go to university. Maybe I should try something past grade 12. And so I eventually chose the First Nations University of Canada because I was a First Nations person, and I didn't really know what that meant. I, I, I went to the First Nations University, I applied, I got accepted, and reality hit. I started school in 2008. And I'm a very confident person. I can come off as very confident when I'm standing here speaking today. When you met me in 2008, this wasn't Cadmus. I was, uh, I like to laugh, but I wasn't a public speaker. And so when I went to First Nations University of Canada, I started to, I took, I took an English class. I'm just taking, giving you my introduction here because I'm going to lead into youth engagement regardless of, of race, or regardless of identity. I'm just giving you an introduction to myself. I entered university in 2008 with a, with a wanting to know who I was because I didn't really know what, who I was. Just because I grew up on the First Nation, just because I'm, I was a First Nations person, just because my parents raised me didn't necessarily mean I knew who I was. Just because I graduated from a First Nations school, it didn't necessarily mean I knew who I was. And so when I went to First Nations University of Canada, I took an English class, English 100. If anybody goes to university, you got to take English 100. It's a mandatory introduction class. And we started at First Nations University, you use Indigenous um, knowledge. So we started reading these indigenous poetry. I read poetry from Chief Dan George. I read all these short stories, fictional stories, legendary stories. And then I start having questions. I'm like, huh, you know, and then I was reading all these poems. And there was one poem in there very, very specifically is called A Lament for Confederation by Chief Dan George. He read it to the uh, Stanley Park, 250,000 people in 1967 at the one year, 100 year centennial. And this poem just awoke in me and I remember the weekend I went home as I normally did back to my community as many university people do go back to their communities in the weekends. I read this poem to my mom and dad. I was so excited to read it to them because it was just such a mind changer to me. And it's as if this, this little fire started to burn inside my spirit and my heart and I wanted to know more. I then took Cree 100 because I wanted to know my language. The only things I knew in Cree were the dirty words my grandpa used to tell me. <laughs> I thought my name was Awas growing up. In Cree that means go away, Awas, that's what they used to tell me. So I thought that was my nickname, but it wasn't. And so I took Cree 100 because I wanted to start speaking a little bit of my language. I was so interested, I couldn't figure out why my people weren't speaking my language on cows as being a young First Nations person. I didn't know the history. Like, they don't talk about residential school in our communities. We just know it was a part of it. So I took Cree 100. I took Indigenous Studies 100 because I wanted to know who my people were, who I was. And Indigenous Studies 100 was so impactful. And just imagine this class of 120 people. And I walked in my first semester, very intimidating, intimidated student. And um, I went sat in the front in the corner where nobody could see me. And I turned around and I couldn't figure out why 100 non-Indigenous people wanted to learn about Indigenous people. I was so thrown off. Then I realized later on that it was a mandatory class that a lot of people had to take it. <laughs> thinking, oh, well, that's why it's mandatory. And so. In comes this teacher, 
and uh, she starts teaching. And she starts talking about all these things that happen to indigenous people. Like we're talking way back in the 1400s, the 1500s, 1600s, going on and on and on. And then people in the class would debate with her and say, no, that's not how it happened. Indigenous people, they kind of did it to themselves and stuff like dot, dot, dot. And she would stand there and defend. And she wasn't even an indigenous person. And I was sitting in the corner just saying, you tell him, you, you tell him. I was just her little cheerleader in the corner. And one day she, she spotted me out about third or fourth class. And she, um, she said, Cadmus, what do you think? And I just panicked. I totally, my heart was just beating. I read all the material she told us to, and I just went blank. And that was my first moment of truth of stepping up as a young leader is somebody put me on the spot because they wanted me to hear, they wanted to hear my opinion. And as a young person at the time, I'm like, nobody really asked me for my opinion. They just, you just assume your leadership, you just assume, you know, the people are going to do it and you just jump on the boat and you just enjoy it with them. And I didn't have the best answer that time. I stuttered, I sounded scared, but just my teacher telling me and asking me to tell everybody what I thought, she started to already empower me. And throughout the class, I started to get more comfortable and I started to speak up more. I started to ask more questions. I started to debate in a friendly manner with my classmates about the true history of how I found it growing up on the First Nation. And what this teacher was doing to me is she was preparing me to make myself feel that you don't have to be elected. You don't have to be you know, appointed to be a leader, just speak your mind and you know, be very respectful about it. She was very stern on that. And so that Indigenous Studies class really, really allowed me to understand. Then I started to attend more of my band meetings because as towns and cities have meetings, First Nations have them as well. I started to attend meetings and I remember one of the meetings Myers Norris Penny was presenting to us and this guy, as good as he was, he was talking in a French language to a bunch of English people. And, and I'm talking accounting terms. And so my elders and my, my, my adults, and almost no youth were there. I was probably one of the younger ones. He was trying to break down this audit, and this is your capital, and this is your expenses, this is your, your liquidity, and he's going on and on and on. All these words are just voom, voom, voom over people. And I started to look around, and I'm like, you know what? My people need an accountant that looks like us, that can stand up here and explain things in the two terms. And so it was at that band meeting that I said, okay, I'm gonna focus on accounting. I wanna get into business. And so I joined the School of Business. That actually made me wanna join the School of Business because I wanted to come back home to my community, to my First Nation and help because I can see the deer in headlights eyes of my own people. And I'm like, if you can, explain things better, you'll have better questions, which you'll have better results. And so I started focusing on accounting. I ended up fo uh, majoring in management, so I'm not gonna tell you my whole story. But I just wanted to give you that introduction because um, I'm the chief of Cows' First Nation. We run a $15 million operation at home. We have about $50 million in assets, that's including all of our houses, all of our assets at home. And we're a very progressive nation. We run an unqualified uh, audit nation. We have good governance. All of our stakeholders are, are, are on the right path. We have good purchase power agreement with such things as SAS Power. We have a solar turbine and battery storage. We're the only first nation to have a purchase power agreement with a crown corporation. We have a very good relationship with our local municipalities and RMs. We have a very good relationship with the city of Regina, city of Yorkton, city of Saskatoon. When I walk into meetings, I'm sometimes one of the most youngest people in some of these meetings. My council, I get elected with a council. I'm the youngest out of all of them. And so there's actually one counselor, I think he's a little younger than me, but he's definitely just as mature as I am. When I go into band meetings, when I go into elders, uh, they all, you know, people will say, well, you don't look like a chief. And I always laugh, I'm, I, I don't have a big belly, I always tell them. I always kind of <laughs> joke like that, eh? 
And they're like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying your belly, they say. I'm saying you don't look like a chief, like you don't look gray, you don't look. And when I started talking to my people about running for chief in 2015, I started to tell them my vision. I started to tell them why I wanted to be a chief. How come I went and got my master's? How come I went and got my undergrad? And what I wanted to accomplish and come home. And one of the first things, and your youth and your community will go through this. The first thing that I would get is, oh, well, I just remember you as being a cheeky little res kid here. Like you were always comical and funny, but I never really heard you talk politics and strategy before. And then I'd tell them, well, give me a chance now. And so we'd sit down and have coffee, break bannock, whatever it was in their home. And by the end of our session, they would look at me and say, if you run for chief, I believe, I believe in your vision. I believe in what you're doing. I had to do that. I had to prove myself every day as a leader should. But I felt because I was so young, I had to prove myself more than someone maybe 50 or 40 years old that was doing the same thing just because of my age. And so that fear of unknown I felt was a barrier, but I could control that by just my personality, my character, my education. I would explain things in very simple terms as to how I wanted to do it with that auditor, but I'm not an auditor, I, I'm not a financial. I, I did one audit presentation in my community and my council begged me to never do another one. I, <laughs> so I told them I saved us money, but I won't do one for a while. And so I was elected in 2016 with 83% of the vote. I ran against four people, very clean campaign, and I just stuck on my, my vision. And once, my, once I got in, my ones that maybe didn't believe in me said, now here's your chance to prove yourself. And so every day I would prove myself over and over and over. It took me a year and a half to focus only on showing people that Cadmus can do it. I had to show them that Cadmus can do it. And I'd get so frustrated at times because I'm like, I can talk strategy, I can talk growth, I can talk partnership, but yet I'm getting questioned, can Cadmus, is he worthy of doing this? And so it took me a year and a half to get past that. After that year and a half was done, people would stop questioning me that if I can do it, they started questioning me on how come we're not moving faster. And that's what I wanted them to tell me. And I'm like, that's what I want you to tell me. Say, Chief, how come we're not moving faster? Because that's my role as a leader is to nudge, nudge every day, everybody. And people ask, what is the role of a chief? A chief is not a mayor. You're not a minister. You're not a premier. You're, 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 you're a chief. I have to look after our, I manage poverty. On a daily, my phone rings, my, my inbox on my Facebook goes, chief, I need money, chief, I, my door handle on my, my house is not working. And I was thinking, I wonder if mayors ever get these kind of questions. I was like, <laughs> I don't think they do. But that's a reality of what a chief does. I'm a protector of our children's rights. I'm a protector of our treaty rights. I'm a protector of, of our assets. I, as my mom would tell me, I use my best friends more than my worst enemy, as my mom always told me growing up. I would use these. Right now I'm talking a lot, but I do listen. And so, you know, I have to make sure that, and this is a key part to youth engagement, different age groups have different needs and wants. You're 21 and under, they want to keep busy. They want to go to school. They want to play sports. They want to play video games. They need Wi-Fi. They will not survive without it. Your 22 to 54-year-olds require training, jobs, that internal tuition, that, you, that intuition you speak to, the ones that are dependent on SA, the ones that think that they're entitled to be looked after, you speak to that internal voice in them and tell them that that warrior spirit has to be alive and well. Nobody has entitlement in this world. Everybody, you know, has to pay a, play a part. I do that to my, they get so upset with me sometimes. 
And, you know, and by the end of the day, they're like, thank you, Chief. I really understand what you're trying to do. I still don't agree with you, but I understand what you're trying to do. Then you got your 55 plus. They want security. They're getting older. They want to know that the band or the nation is going to look after them. They want to know that as they get older, that someone is going to be there for them. The depression, the loneliness. And those are realities. That's what a chief does. I do all of that every day. And what is being a chief? I can explain it in a very simple term. You're sometimes doing the impossible for the ungrateful. <laughs> and I mean that in the most nicest way because no matter what I do, I always got a Facebook group that is criticizing me, that I didn't do it right, that I'm selling out on treaty, that I'm, I'm working with, the, with SUMA because uh, I want us to be a municipality now. Every day you get criticized. But, you know, you just got to continue that, that optimistic attitude. And that's what our youth have today. Our youth are very optimistic, especially at a certain age. And then when they start to think of the reality, especially in the north, I've been to the north. I know, I see it, I, I can really relate. Because the south, we might, definitely might be more to s municipalities and cities and Wi-Fi and, but the, the same optimism starts to fade away. And if as adults, we don't address it until it's too late, and then you end up doing Band-Aid solution stuff over and over and over and it's just amazing at how simple it could be if we can just identify it. You can give youth centers, you can give all these land-based training, very, very detailed stuff are needed. But the biggest thing that is needed is those conversations, is those understanding. Every youth has a different, you can't paint a brush, especially gender difference is really huge. Like I speak to to young females, to young males, and my message is different to both of them. My attitude is different to both of them. My humor is different to both of them because they both have different needs and different wants. But I just wanted to finish off my introduction in my chief role as um, I absolutely love it. I plan on doing this for a while. I have one gray hair for every month I've been in. It's, it's the cows, herbs, and berries that keep my hair nice and black and silky. It's not for sale, so you can't ask for it. But I wanted to uh, get into actual, in order to understand youth engagement, you have to understand generation difference. And we're living right now with five different generations. Any generation that was born between 19, for before 1945 are our traditionalists. A traditionalist generation those are the ones that have the stories of World War II. They heard the stories of World War I. They appreciate every little thing that is in their yard. Sometimes the younger generation will call it hoardering. <laughs> the traditionalists say, I earned everything in this yard. I wasn't given anything. The traditionalists are very stern, very hardworking, and sometimes Generation X and Y, which I'm getting to, don't understand a traditionalist. This is a traditionalist, and I absolutely love it. This elder said in, in, in the, my nation, my grandkid, I don't understand, he said. He has two arms and two legs. I don't know why he's not working. He said, and I kind of laughed. I was like, you can't really tell a youth that anymore today. Like you got to address, you know, the mental, emotional side. You got to be very cautious with the words you use. A traditionalist is very stern, you know, hardworking. That's a generation that we still have with us today. And they're very elderly now. And a lot of them are starting to get into the depression. They're starting to get lonely. We got to really look after our, our traditionalists. From 46 to 64, you got your baby boomers. My mom and dad are baby boomers. Very big population after World War II, you know, and uh, the baby boomers, they are the ones that really set our economy and what it's going today. They're starting to retire. Generation X and Y can kind of relate, but they can't relate to our, our baby boomers. And that is a really big thing is to understand your, your, your aspect of it because you have to relate, you have to 
our youth are very, they're, they're so, I'm going to get to them in more detail right away, but they're, they, they expect results right now where a baby boomer knows that it takes one day at a time and the intangibles matter. You're not going to see it, but you know it's there. And, you know, I was raised by baby boomers, and I talk about the, um, the uh, hoardering because um, my dad passed away a year and a half ago. He, he got Alzheimer's, and it, uh, we, he lived as long as he could. A great man, great man. And anyways, <clears throat> I inherited his yard, and it was junk from what I've seen. <laughs> I'm like, why would he keep a plug-in, and it doesn't even have an end on it? And I could just hear his voice in my head saying, I'll fix it, I'll fix it. And so anyways, I started putting two piles in, the junk pile and the keep pile. His best friend, his name's Freddie, came over one day. <clears throat> and I was telling Freddie, I don't understand why my dad has all this junk. And he says, you know what? To you, it's junk. To him, it was treasure. Because he didn't get given any of this. He earned everything in this yard you got it inherited, you got it given to you. You didn't do anything to deserve this except be his son. And he just taught me a valuable lesson right there. I get it. I'm a generation now that is almost, I feel entitled to things just because my parents work so hard at things that I think I can just, I just get it. And so he really humbled me that day that baby boomers are ones today that really set the tone moving forward. After the baby boomers comes Generation X, age 65 to 79. These are the ones that know what a cell phone is, know how to text, they know how to reply, they, they have all the accounts, maybe not Snapchat, Snapchat's a little too of the young generation, but they know how to tweet, they know how to Facebook, they're probably the biggest Facebookers in regards to just, you know, wanting to know what's going on and never replying. Kind of one of those silent friends on Facebook, got a lot of those. But the Generation X is a generation that is baby boomer, but yet today contemporary, knows that technology is really changed and technology is there to help us. And so the technology part is really key to understanding our youth today. And then you got your Generation Y, I'm a Generation Y. You got 80 to 95, if you're born in 80 to 95. This is the generation where you know education is key, education is important. You think that, um, you're, you're starting to think that you want, uh, how can I best say it, that you want leaps with technology. You think technology is like really key to everything. Everything is about, you know, everything has to have technology in it. Um, I can get more into detail. I want to get through these other two first. Your last generation that we still have today is your Generation Z. And that is born in 96 and on. Born 96 and on, Generation Z do not know where they were September 11th, 2001. All the other generations know that day where you were. You can pinpoint where you were when that day was here. Generation Z doesn't know. You ask them, they were too young. They were just maybe not born yet, they were too young. But there's a difference in scope and attitude with each of these generations. And so when we talk about youth and you talk about engagement and you talk about empowering, you have to understand that generations really do mean something. It doesn't mean that you can't all sit in the same room, but sometimes when you go home and you have engagements and you look around and you see that there's no youth in the room, sometimes you gotta step back and assess yourself. Are we engaging enough to bring our youth in here? Because in 2008, when I was in university, I was one of the youngest ones in our band meeting. And I was so like just thrown off saying, why are youth not involved in our band meetings? Like this isn't so important, this is our nation. And now today I try and make it more engaging for our youth to come by being funny, by including them, by asking them, by calling them out right on the spot as my teacher did to me, not to corner them, but to like let them know they have a voice. You know, our youth center is really key at home. It's not just for pool and for video games and for ping pong. It's for adults to go there and ask questions and hang out with the youth in their comfortable environment. 
And so you start to gain those, those relationships. But difference of scope and attitude is really key. But one more thing while I'm on the generation difference is, I don't know if any of you know the color spectrum, but the color spectrum is really important in your work environment. There's four colors. So I'm a green. Everybody in here, you're a color. And it defines if you're an introvert, an extrovert, if you're um, emotional in your decision making, or if you're stern and have, uh, you know, almost no emotion in your, you know, you ever, you ever be in a work environment and two staff members are totally just at each other? 95% of the time, it's not that they don't disagree, it's that how their color spectrums so differ from each other. And that's really important when engaging with youth because just because youth don't wanna talk back or they don't wanna say anything doesn't mean they're not interested. It's just that they're just so different today. They could they can do things like um, their attitude their attention span, I'll start with their attention span. Attention span is amazing for a youth today. Another thing is, is they multi multitask. They can be watching Netflix on Facebook and doing talking to you all, all at the same time. Very good multitaskers. And that's something maybe an older generation doesn't get. They also have independence versus collaboration. They would rather work alone sometimes, some will. And I'm, I'm not painting all youth, I'm just giving you ideas of how you can use a color spectrum when you're working with your youth. Um, they're digital pioneers. So one of the things I did study, I wanted to make sure I got my facts right, I'm a facts person. In 1995, in Canada, 14% of people had Wi-Fi. In 2014, 87% of people had Wi-Fi. And so we're dealing with a whole new generation. And I, I, was, I, I don't know how to take this one, but I kind of laughed when I heard it. You ask youth today, they will put Wi-Fi as more important than having a public bathroom. They are so keen on making sure they have Wi-Fi that if they had to choose one, they would choose Wi-Fi over a bathroom. And so like that just shows you how digital pioneers we have. And a lot of us could use a lot of this digital pioneer. Um, they are very optimistic and this is really key because I'm gonna get into the, to the nuts and bolts of the North here right away with, uh, you know, I'm gonna get into some of the serious part, maybe uh, the suicide conversation and, and stuff like that. That has to be, it's a very important, but optimistic vision is really key and our youth have it but they lose it when they start to get ba weighed down by the challenges of just being a youth in a digital era when YouTube is showing them so much. And one of the worst things our youth have today that maybe some of us didn't was a youth today by the age of 14 have seen 14,000 people die in a video game, on a movie, and it totally changes their values as if it's accept acceptable to hear in one of these growing countries, maybe Iraq, Afghanistan, when we hear on the news these terrible things that are happening, a youth who has seen 14,000 people die through video game, it's like meh, it just doesn't bother them, it's just so normal to them. And that's changing a lot of values and you know, I'm constantly reminding my youth don't let your video games, don't let your movies predict your feelings to how you must make sure everybody in this world is treated with the best. And that's a reality that some of us don't realize that our youth go through and that's where that optimistic vision is either make it or break it. And you know, a lot of them will go home to home fires that support them, home fires that will um, you know, encourage them some of our youth go home to home fires that don't do that. And a lot of us might not take that into consideration because we're just so used to our home fires being encouraging, you know, being clean, being, you know, just, just comfortable. Some of our youth don't go to that. And then those youth end up connecting with our youth and it just throws it off. The optimism is, is hit and miss. And so that's why we have to be very cautious in our communities that these 
use centers and these Wi-Fi places, they're really important to have. I was in Regina at Mama Moweatan, that's their new center in Regina. There was five kids sitting along a wall with plugins, just sitting there and the library was there, the gym was there. And I couldn't figure out why these five kids were sitting there. So finally I got so curious, I walked up and I asked one of them, why are you sitting here? He says, I don't have Wi-Fi at home, I have Wi-Fi here. And I'm like, oh, that's why all five of you are here. And so I went home and that's the first thing I asked at the band office, I was like, do we have any public Wi-Fi places here? Because I'm assuming not everybody on Cowboys has Wi-Fi. And they're like, we don't. So we started making our Wi-Fi's public at our band office and our hall. And so people can go there. And it's kind of comical because we have peacekeepers. In their report, they're like, yeah, we had one truck parked outside the band office at 10 p.m. watching Netflix. <laughs> they, <laughs> they pulled up and they were watching Netflix outside the band office. <laughs> So they're, they're all right, they're not drinking or nothing, so just, you know, they're not vandalizing, but, you know, those little things make a big difference in getting our youth to, to, to better, you know, to being optimistic. That's so key to, to staying optimistic. Um, our youth today are very convenient over brands. They're very short-minded, meaning that, um, you know, if someone wrongs us, if you're buying something on a website and it doesn't come right away, you kind of give it a second chance. Or, you know, if someone was kind of ignorant to you in your favorite story, they'll give it a second chance. Some of our youth are not like that. You, know, you get one chance. And if you wrong them, they will hold that against you. They will, maybe not even in shopping, but that is something that is a reality that it's, it's you know, sometimes we're so stern, like, ah, get over it, you know, you know. You'll mature one day, you know, like we just use those, t those terms that are so generic that our parents, our grandparents told us, and that kind of makes the youth say, you know what, I'm different than you, and I'm just going to do it my way, and stuff like that, and these are little things we can pick up on. The next one is, uh, um, they got social, how can I best say this, their social skills have changed so much now face-to-face -face conversations have been removed with texts they'd rather text than have a face-to-face -face conversation and that's going to impact your relationship with your youth and it's really important to to you know continue those those conversations because social media is not going away it's only growing and it's going to stay it's going to be here I'm on all the social networks imaginable just so I can keep up with my youth. At the same time, I teach my elders what Facebook is. I help them with a Facebook group. I'll show them what it is. And it's so funny being in a meeting today at home. I'm like, where did you hear that? I'll ask him, on Facebook. And I kind of laugh. I'm like, oh, well, it's official then. It's on Facebook. So, <laughs> um, But those are things that, that you just have to. I just wanted to name a couple of those things. I wanted to get into the details of the North. Um, my friend Corey Osoup did this amazing report last year on our youth in the north. And the youth in the north are um, in, in a crisis, and I mean that in the nicest way, but at the same time, it's within our control. There's four things in a SWOT analysis, your strengths and weaknesses, that's what we can control. Your threats and your opportunities, that's the world, that's we can't control. And I'll identify them in a SWOT analysis with our youth. I'm going to start with the threats and the opportunities, things we can't control. A threat and an opportunity is YouTube. It's both a threat and an opportunity. We can't control YouTube. We can control Wi-Fi, but we can't control YouTube. Our kids will watch YouTube videos all day if they could. And they're not watching superstars. They're watching these normal people do funny, crazy things, and they start to relate to it. And those are threats and opportunities because it's easy to go on YouTube and just type in suicide. It's easy on YouTube to type in how to make people laugh and they're doing all these ignorant things to very nice people and they can want to relate, they want to go do it. So that's a threat and an opportunity. We can't control that. Another threat and an opportunity is um, they have to move away. 
that's a reality. The infrastructure in the north sometimes is not an option to go to university. It's not an option to get training. They have to move. They have to move to PA, Saskatoon, Regina. And this is how it is when you're living in a community that is 10 kilometers an hour and the pace, you love it. The moment that you drop someone in a city, 100 kilometers an hour, sink or swim. Take, get taken advantage of, get, you're so, you're, you just, you believe everybody because you come from a community where you trust. That's a threat, but it's also an opportunity because we have so much faith in sending our youth to these cities. And then we sit there and hope and pray that they come back one day and help us. And they, you know, that's another opportunity and threat is our economies sometimes don't relate to the dollars that they know they're worth after training. But those are, that's a SWOT analysis. I'm just giving you an idea. Now let's focus on what we can control and that is our strengths and our weaknesses. A strength is, is we love our children, we love our youth, there is no question there. And you can show that. But sometimes we um, tend to, I don't know what it is, but it's, I, I don't know how to define it as just to give you a picture in your mind of, when you go into a place, it's as if the youth have to sit here and the adults have to sit there. And there's already a disconnection. That's not known weakness in every one of our communities. Of You always have that one adult that can walk in and just be the butterfly and go sit with the youth. And that's how I act today back home. And then I get up after talking to them and I go sit down with our elders. And I do that not because I have to, but because I really know that I have to relate to my youth because I have to show them. I have to show them how it is to interact. I have to show them how it is. I lead by example. But every community has to have that. If you don't have that, then you have to be that. You have to go and engage with the youth. Sometimes we just think that as adults, it's the use, it's the use responsibility to come sit with us and talk to us. And you know, you have to, you have to, we have to go back kind of halfway, I guess I can put it. But that is a weakness that sometimes our youth face with us. And I, I agree, I know maybe some of you are thinking, well, you know, if I was to go sit there, I wouldn't know what to say. I'm not funny. I wouldn't know what to, how to, you know, just engaging with them and, you know, just, just knowing, you know, just, you'd be amazed at what a youth will tell you once they can trust you. Like two weeks ago on Cowses, I helped a young girl who was getting inboxed by a male man, not nice things. And she told me, because she said, I always see you walking around the community and shaking everybody's hand. I, I trusted you because I see you so much. I helped this young girl just by, just by simply walking into a room and engaging with everybody and always showing her my, my good attitude. I'm, I'm assuming that that doesn't just happen in houses. I'm assuming that happens everywhere. But you know, it's just that trust, that trust relationship. But moving back to the strengths is our youth have to know that they have a role in the community. They have to make sure that they, they feel wanted. In Corey's book, when I read it, I'm not sure if all of you read Corey Osoup's book, our, our child advocate. He went up north and he went and spent time in Buffalo Narrows and I believe he was in Buffalo Narrows, was, was he? Corey Osoup, uh, Lalosh and stuff like that. And, um, you know, he just talked about our youth, just they felt like how I felt before I went to university. They didn't know who they were. They didn't know what their role was. They only were told that, you know, and I'll speak from an indigenous perspective. When you talk about indigenous people, you talk about residential school, you talk about 60s scoop, you talk about the Indian Act, you talk about assimilation. Very negative, very, very bad things that happen. But they don't talk about the legendary stories. They don't talk about the humor, the law that was given to us from our creator. They don't talk about how strong and resilient our ancestors were and how we had a great governance structure here on this land and how we had our own, there was no kids in care and no, no one was unemployed at one time. 
And when you start to awaken them with these beautiful stories, now remove the indigenous and now put in your community if you have a German background or if you have a, you know, a Ukrainian background or if you have an Inuit Dene background, a Dene background or an Inuit, the youth are, are thriving for these stories. And if they're not told them, then they start to think, well, maybe I shouldn't be an Indian. Maybe I shouldn't, you know, be who I want. Maybe, you know, when I go to Regina, I don't want to tell people I'm from La Loche because I don't want to be judged. I'm just making these up. I'm just, I'm not trying to say La Loche is not a, I think La Loche is an amazing place. I've never been, but I'm very, very in tune with what's going on. All I'm trying to get at is our youth have to be proud of who they are regardless. And that is our responsibility to our kids to do that, is to engage and to, to instill. I go to schools, I go to my school today and I tell legendary stories, the legendary story of the dog, legendary story of the moose. I'll tell you the legendary story of the dog. I gotta make you guys laugh. I feel like we're kind of getting dry here. <laughs> this is an, a real indigenous legendary story and our youth used to hear 10 of these a, a day from the ages of three to the ages of 10. If this, our youth don't hear these anymore because of colonization. All of Canada has a missed opportunity because all of our youth should hear these stories and how beautiful they are. Here's the legendary story of the dogs. Many, many moons ago, I'm talking way before Christopher Columbus, my ancestors lived on, on North America. There was a time when my ancestors, the indigenous people and animals could talk to one another. There was a time when this, this, this used to happen. One day, all the dogs decided to have a grand meeting, so they started running out and telling the other dogs. And one day, this Cree male, his name was Wasaki Chuck, he heard these dogs talking and he got excited. He's like, oh, you're having a meeting? I'll come. And the dog said, nope, humans are forbidden. This is for dogs only. And Wasaki Chuck started to mit the way in Cree, you say pout. He started to mit the way, pout around. And he started saying, I'll come to your meeting. They're like, nope. Humans are forbidden. So all these dogs got to their grand meeting. It was at this teepee. Every dog got to the teepee door, unhooked their tail, put it on the outside of the teepee, and then went inside. And when all these dogs started their meeting, Wasaki Chuck, this Cree male, was still pouting, mitoing. You know how you pout when you don't get your way in life? That's what he was doing. And he says, I'm going to play a trick on these dogs. So one day when they have a meeting, they're going to invite me again. And so he snuck up behind the teepee, and he started a fire. And when the fire got bigger, he ran up to the back of the teepee and he said, fire! And he hit the teepee and all these dogs started panicking. There was only one door. They were all trying to get out. When they got out, there was so much tails, they couldn't find their, their tail. So they grabbed any tail they could, hooked it on and then took off running. That's why today when two dogs meet each other, they sniff each other's tail because they're still <laughs> looking for their original tail. Imagine if your youth heard five stories like that a day from the age of the three to the age of 10, how their ideology in this world would be so different. Next time they would go to the park, they would say, mom, dad, koko, mushum, grandma, grandpa, look at that dog's looking for his original tail. Meanwhile, he's sniffing another dog's butt. <laughs> and everybody would laugh because that legendary story is not about a dog and a teepee. It's about humor and the way you look at the world. This world is forever evolving. Indigenous people had this and we lost it. It's sleeping. And now these legendary stories are starting to come back. This was our school. Those were our textbooks. And now today, Canada, as a treaty partner, was supposed to bring in the indigenous ideology into their lifestyle. That was the treaty promise. And instead, they tried to erase it. Not us in the room, we inherited this. We didn't create it, we inherited this. And now today, that's a missed opportunity. But the why I, I use that is I'm gonna talk about some of the youth in the North. They desperately need that right now. They don't know how to find humor in life because of maybe the intergenerational trauma, maybe because of uh, just legacy of residential school. Maybe it's the fact that their traditionalist 
grandparents are raising them and they're a generation Z and they have nothing they can find that relates them. Or maybe they're so in love with their kokum and mushum or grandma and grandpa that they will sacrifice going to school, going to university, moving to a city, finding a job just to stay and make sure that their grandma and grandpa kokum and mushum are looked after, which they're probably going to pay for later because they might not have the right training to survive. These are what our youth go through every day. And these legendary stories and my role as a, as a young person who didn't know who I was, my identity means everything to me today. You'll never meet a more proud First Nation Nehawak person, but I don't go around bragging about it. I have my braid to honor my ancestors. It's, I don't plug it in. It's not like Avatar. I don't do that. I have it to honor my ancestors because my people tell me that there was a fire. There's a fire that's burning right now in that world that we call the happy hunting grounds, heaven. There's a fire burning right now. And every time a child comes into this world, they take a little bit of that flame and they put it on that soft spot. And that's why men and women have braids because that's where that flame is and we walk around very proud with it my ancestors did now today i got young indigenous males saying men don't have long hair and i said since when show me and they don't know what to say they're like that's for girls i'm like you know what it's not and i'll explain it to them i grew my braid because my best friend he had a little boy his name was eagle eagle's a teenager now Eagle came home one day and he says, I don't want my braid, Dad. They tease me at school. And I used to wear a little faux hawk. I had a little short hair. And I was telling Mike, that's his dad, I was like telling Mike, we should grow a braid. And Mike said, let's do it. That was six years ago. Mike and I, his dad, decided to grow a braid because Eagle, now today, Eagle has long hair. A lot of these young boys have long hair. And I'm teaching our youth the importance of their identity, especially indigenous men. Indigenous men is my specialty because I'm an indigenous male. I can really relate to them. But back to the identity part, it's really key. And we can't rely upon our only our schools to do it because our schools are just thriving with just trying to get their marks done. Sometimes our schools are social work. Our teachers are social workers. Sometimes they're therapists. Sometimes they're the food bank. And then we expect them to teach our youth at the same time. And your community has to buy into it. Your entire community has to invest in your youth to make sure that they succeed. Because your youth are might most likely going to move away, as I did. But I never forgot where I came from. Every day, I would do something for cows as if it was studying in class, I'd relate it to cows sitting there relating it. How can I bring this home to cows? I would come home on weekends, weekend on holidays, summer. I would see people and they would get older. They're so excited in what I was doing off the reserve. They would want to know everything and I would tell them. And now that I'm home being chief, that is the reason why I wanted to be chief at such a young age is because I couldn't really find someone that I felt could do the youth engagement that can be a chief. And I'm doing it one day at a time. And there's so much of me out there. There's so much people like me out there. And I'm starting to see more younger chiefs running today. You know, at one time I can only count one chief in our federation that was just as young as me. And when I started going into these chief meetings, I could feel that um, I was definitely looked at as young. I can feel it. But after I started to voice and show that I was there to, to collaborate and not, you know, you know, they were, I don't know how to say it. I, I, I felt like as if some were just like, you're too young to be a chief. But after a while, I'd start speaking up and they're like, hmm, you're a fresh of breath air in here. You know, like I never really looked at it like that. And so now today, I continue to show that. And all of us need that in our communities. All of us need that. In, and there's youth in your community that are just like me, if not better. 
And sometimes you have to be that teacher to call them out to awaken their voice. And they're probably going to get scared. They, they're going to look so intimidating. They're going to probably sweat. But once you awaken that, you know, they're going to start being more engaged. And that's my hope is I'm, I'm absolutely a big fan of, of, of SUMA. I think the Saskatchewan, I think the province, we are the best. I think we have some work to do. I definitely know that. I, um, I'm a big advocate of the truth and reconciliation. I'm a huge advocate to make sure that both worlds understand. And I mean this in the most polite but direct way that there is two ideologies in this province. There's the Canadian, the Canadian, and that's the constitution, but then there's a first nation. And sometimes they're looked at as, 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 I don't know how else to say it, but they're looked at as like, as if they're competing. And I have the ability to walk in both worlds because I can speak the bureaucracy terms, but then I can turn around and go home and speak the indigenous terms as well. And they're the same. And our youth don't see it like that. And I, I can't understand because I don't see it like that, but I'm in meetings where, like I'll give you an example. I'm sitting in a chief's meeting and I was asking another chief, how come the province never comes and sits with the chiefs? I couldn't figure it out. And one meeting, a minister came and sat with the chiefs about gaming. And I just want to tell you, because this is, I find it generational and different. He comes in and he sits down and he speaks to the chiefs. He tells the chiefs about the gaming agreement. And then at the end, I was like, is there a chance to ask questions? And they're like, I don't know. So somebody asked a question, a chief, and the minister stood up and said, I ain't here to ask, answer questions. I'm just here to talk to you. And he walks away. And I'm like, wow, our relationship is really like a f arranged marriage here. We're just not happy. <laughs> like, how, how do we amend that? And if we want to fix the youth, in, in the, the, the youth issue in the north, if we want to make sure that this province is the greatest that we know it should be, then we have to change our behavior and attitude on both sides. And it's not the younger generation that I tell that to. It's the older generation that I tell that to. Because, yeah, we've been through years of misfortune and disagreement and personal times. Maybe something happened wronged us that, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you an example of intergenerational trauma. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up right away. Intergenerational trauma. My mom and dad made me, made this game called Duck the Police. This is intergenerational trauma. When I was four, we used to go to Broadview from Cowes' in our old Powell van. <clears throat> and my dad would say, duck the cops, and I'd duck. Because <laughs> that was the game he would make us play. At the age of seven, we were parked outside Broadview Bakery one day, the best bakery in the south. And this police car pulled up behind our Powell van, and I hit the floor. <laughs> I felt so guilty, and I didn't know why I felt so guilty, but I, every time I seen a cop including that time, I would feel guilty and I'd feel shy around the police. My parents were instilling into me this game. And as I got older, I started to realize it was intergenerational trauma. This is why. My mom was born in 48. She hid with her grandma in a bush so they wouldn't take her to residential school. Who came and got her in that bush? The RCMP. My mom never trusted the RCMP after that. She hated police because of what they forced her to do when she was just trying to hide in a bush with her grandma. And I, I mean hate is not every police officer, just the, what they did to her, she could never overcome. So I just want to make sure that. My mom does respect police officers, but she just could never overcome that. My dad, born in 48, moved off to the reserve, played sports, tried to work, it was really tough to be an Indian in the 60s and 70s in this province off the reserve. Really tough. He would always end up in the slammer for defending himself for being an Indian. He would get the, he'd be the one thrown in the slammer in the jail. And so he never trusted police after that. And so here I was born in 1982. Coming to this world pure and innocent, ready to take on whatever came up to me. By the age of three, my parents were instilling me into me to not trust the police because of what they've been through. 
By the age of 10, they made me feel as how they feel around police. My heart would just be fluttering. And I started to realize they're teaching me intergenerational trauma. I didn't live in that era, but they're raising me as if I did. Now, using that intergenerational trauma, sometimes the words we say around our kitchen tables and the attitude we have, and I'm talking both sides, I'm not just saying it's not the non-First Nation, it's the First Nation as well. We're starting to instill that into our youth and we're setting them up for failure right away because that is our past now. We have a truth and reconciliation, 94 calls to action. But there's something that doesn't say in there, and this is another one, forgiveness and reconciliation is another one. Those 94 calls to action are your municipalities, your interpersonal, your political system, your churches, your, your, your health. They're defined in there. But one of the things I'm an advocate for is helping us change our behavior and attitude because if we don't do it, then we're just going to hand it off of, to our kids to figure out. And we can control that. That's what makes this province so amazing. I believe one day I'm going to sit there and a minister is going to come in to a chief's meeting and we're going to laugh and shake hands and sit down and start collaborating on how this province should that's not happening right now. I'm not here to get political. I think all parties have their mandates and they have their responsibilities, but we are the rights holders and I know we can make a difference. So in conclusion, I just wanna thank you for uh, giving me an hour of your time. I do wanna take questions. If I didn't take all my time up, my nose is starting to grow, so I'm gonna pause there. So thank you very much. Yeah, I certainly want to thank uh, Chief Cadmus, Lorm, for being here. I know for me, his talk was very inspirational. And I truly believe, well, it's one of his last comments was that we need to tell this to the older people in the community. Because I really believe we can't change our young, young children the way that society is shaped today. There's not much we can do but learn to relate to them and understand where they're going and I guess adapt along with them. It's a tough world out there. And uh, you know, they are our future. I'm really inspired by Chief, the young person that he is. You know, it makes me proud to be able to say this young man is a chief, a leader of our Aboriginal, one of our Aboriginal communities and the work that he's doing with his young people in his community and with the community as a whole. That's what we all look forward to. I certainly do. And I think that we could use those kind of words in our communities. So I just encourage you all to get his address because I think we might want to want to get him up to talk to our people. <laughs> no, seriously, it's true. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the stuff about ministers and, and whatnot, you know, they, uh, yeah, they're too serious. We had one like that. He's from Isle of the Cross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, him they have to keep him quiet. <laughs> but no, certainly you know it's good, it's, and it's good to you know share a little bit of humor with it. And you know, in our in our Aboriginal uh, country, we use a lot of humor because basically it's a way of survival for us. We didn't just want to hang our heads and pout like you mentioned. We want to say, yeah, let's let's get over it. Let's uh, carry on. And we need to find the, those same ways with our young people. Yeah. So again, I really appreciate that you're being here. So thank you for taking part in the session. We appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. And uh, we have a... Oh, thank you. Thank you. you. Yeah. Token of appreciation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't know what's in there. If it's a, if it, if it's a, car, if it's a card, Suma gave it to you. If it's a million dollars, I want it back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, I guess, uh, folks, that, uh, <clears throat> that concludes uh, our session today. But I have an announcement here for you guys here. 
Um, I want to thank you folks for coming for sure. You know, without you people here, the, the messages wouldn't get out. And, uh, you know, we need to have people come out and listen to these so that we can take messages back home. Uh, again, it's available. It's going to be available on Suma's YouTube, the channel, uh, and YouTube channel later this month. And if you're attending tonight's President's Banquet and Awards Ceremony, doors open at 6.30, and I hope to see you there. So thank you very much. Have a great day. God bless you all. Take care. Thanks again.